Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sophie Kravitz. Thanks for the introduction, Michael. He cut out while he was talking, so I couldn't hear it. I'm pretty excited and proud to be here on the 10th anniversary of this event. I was And Sophie, I'm going to jump in quickly. We're having a little bit of problem with your audio. Um, oh. So uh, let me see if me dropping out fixes it. OK. How's that? How's the audio? OK. Um, so. I don't know where I left off, but uh, this community has a ton of experience in design and problem solving, uh, community and openness and sharing and in documentation. And look, there's Alicia. She and Aya Badir started the Open Hardware Summit. So just by way of introduction, I have a background as a, a sculptor and I'm an electronics engineer and I've designed things to train goldfish toy blimp controllers, and I'm currently working on a radio design. I publish most of my schematics, my bills of materials, and boards layouts online in the form of a lab notebook. And sometimes people download and build off of my designs and they make them work better and they tell me about it, which is pretty great. A few years ago, I had an open source product that was used in neuroscience labs and that felt pretty awesome too. I work for SupplyFrame, which is Hackaday's parent company, and you can often find me on Hackaday's community site, hackaday.io. And so I want to do a quick shout out to all of the online hardware communities. They're not even all here. There wasn't enough room on the slide, but I have immense respect and love for all of them. And I probably spend way too much time online hanging out. Hackster.io, Instructables, Adafruit's Discord channel, the One Bit Squared Discord channel, Toymakers, IRC, Tindy, and there's so many more. I'm also pretty blessed to be a part of two physical hacker spaces, NYC Resistor, which is in Brooklyn, New York, and SquidWrench, which is in the Hudson Valley region of New York, which is two hours north of New York City. So my perspective in giving this talk is more than anything else, I am a community member for a really long time. And I feel that now more than ever, we really need community. Besides the coronavirus, the world is experiencing some really bad problems. And we have experienced a lot of bad problems in the world. I mean, problems are cyclical, but people are hungry, temperatures are rising, and we won't be able to grow food in some, some areas of, of the world. Some areas of the world are unaffordable. That's New York City. I think New York City's crazy expensive. And even worse, some people don't have a place to use a bathroom. And I've actually seen people taking a shit in the streets in San Francisco. And you know, these are these are really systemic problems. Um, one of the areas, let's see, let's put off my slides. And uh, just about the recent coronavirus outbreaks, health and data collection hardware is a place where this community has always been able to help. And this is uh, Freak Labs or uh, Akiba's SafeCast project. And he's done a lot of really cool open source data collection projects. But consider this, do we really need more hardware? Our homes are full of consumer electronics and fast fashion. Industry, industry's all done. We built all of the factories and we own, God knows, all of the appliances. I think that consumer society has achieved all it set out to do. And you know we can definitely think beyond that, but be first, I just wanna talk about our history, the open hardware community history, going back maybe 10, 
10, 15, 20 years. I'm gonna go really fast through a bunch of slides. So I was gonna do an icebreaker and do a show of hands if we were here in person and find out how many people were here at the Open Hardware Summit for the first time. So instead, I'm gonna do a welcome shout out to all of you who are here for the first time. And I'll also say high five to all of you who are here for the ninth or 10th time. And although this is the 10th anniversary of the Open Hardware Summit, creating designs and documenting and sharing them has been around for really a lot longer. Some of the first hardware designs that were made available publicly were in print magazines, Nuts and Bolts, Circuit Seller, the ARRL Handbook. And you know this is a project that was built from uh, one of the Nuts and Bolts. And before there was anything called open source or branded open source, there were print magazines to learn from. I had to, I, I found this screenshot and I just had to put it somewhere. So I guess I'll just go all the way back to the early 2000s where some extremely small percentage of people online had fast internet and the rest of us were on dial up. The internet outside of big cities couldn't really download videos and images very quickly. So you have to imagine how hardware education wasn't moving quite as fa fast as it does now. I personally started learning about hardware first on Lady Ada's early website in around 2003. I was an engineering student and previously I'd been an art student and a sculptor. In the New York City art world, people were pretty competitive. It was hard to get people to share even suppliers of tools and materials with you. And so by contrast, when I discovered Lady Ada's website, which broke down very simple concepts like pull-up resistors and grounding, it introduced the idea to me that at least in hardware and at least in engineering, that knowledge was for sharing. Instructables showed up in around 2005. Arduino was founded in 2005. RepRap, which is one of the precursors to all of the affordable and open source printers, showed up in public around 2006. I have a little bit more on RepRap in a few minutes. The first Maker Fair happened in the Bay Area in 2006 in April. Maker Fair, Maker Fair is really important because besides the local hacker spaces, it was one of the few places online you could meet open source hardware designers, see their products and get inspired to create. And uh, Sherry, if you're watching, hi Sherry. And I'm just do a big shout out to Sherry and Dale uh, for co-creating such an influential place. So around that time, 2005, 2006, it was pretty ripe for, with fast internet coming along, for magical communities to form around access to information and the pleasure of teaching and or learning new skills really fast. Collaboration, of course, with others allows the sharing of ideas and learning new things from peers. I remember uh, prototyping was pretty awesome because it was with through-hole components, um, but the software kind of sucked. I used Eagle because it was free, but it was pretty terrible. And I didn't use KiCad at that time. It was free, but I heard it was also awful at that time. And in those early years, the open hardware community went after some of the big problems that we had then. We had some people dealing with trash pickup and sorting. Some people worked on agriculture technology and other people were working on energy issues and DIY solar. And by 2010, there was a strong movement around making and sharing and supporting each other. And a group of folks, including Adafruit Spark Fun, Evil Mad Science Labs, Becky Stern, Bunny, Iya Badir, Alicia Gibb, and a whole bunch more put together a meeting to have a legal open source hardware definition. And if you're in our Discord channel right now or on Twitter, um, give a shout out to each other, whoever was a part of that initial meeting. I definitely don't have, the, the list was really long, but we can say thank you to all of those folks for starting all of this. And you know, even though it's not exactly hardware, I think it's really pretty important culturally to mention that before 2010, most panels were all men with a female moderator, and it was pretty normal to have tech conferences where every single presenter was male. We're not quite there yet, but the open hardware community is more progressive than many others in the tech world, and I, I'm pretty proud of how far we came. This slide doesn't really make much sense unless you're in New York City, but this is the Flushing Local. Um, the seven train, which takes you to where the first open hardware summit happened in 2010. And it was right before the World Maker Fair at the Hall of Science in Queens. And the, the World Maker Fair in New York City is was really different than the Bay Area one. New York City had more fashion and design and the Bay Area Maker Fair had more Burning Man and fire. 
But the open hardware community brought incredible work to shows on both coasts, as well as to the mini maker fairs that were sprouting up all over the place. Seed Studio, an open hardware company formed in 2008. It had been formed in Shenzhen, China. But back then, at least how I remember it, Shenzhen was a name that many of us had never heard of. China wasn't all that accessible. Travel was somehow seemingly more expensive than it is now, or maybe credit cards with miles and all the cheap travel tricks weren't widely known yet. Manufacturing in China as a small company or individual was, was pretty hard at that time, but that led to some innovation, a proliferation of businesses throughout the decade aimed to help people manufacture in China. And in those early years, learning to solder was considered a gateway drug to hardware in general. Maybe it still is. Shout out, Mitch Altman, many, who, who is one of the many people who taught large groups of people to solder. And you know, looking at these, I looked at a lot of learn to solder pick, pictures with lovely, large through-hole components. And it made me feel really nostalgic because I saw a BGA, ball grid array soldering competition for the first time at Hackaday Supercon last November. And so the, world, the word maker became a brand name fueled by the rise of maker fairs. And this all led to the years between 2010 and 2015 being incredibly fast moving for open hardware culture. MakerBot, which is one of the first 3D printers to go mainstream, was famously sold in 2013 for a few hundred million. And this had a lot to do with how the world saw the open hardware and maker communities. Because sometime, suddenly, everything about being a maker and the subset of makers that are hardware creators was a business opportunity. It's important to note, though, precursors to MakerBot. RepRap was one of the first modern 3D printers. It was invented in 2005 by Adrian Boy, Boyer, a mechanical engineering professor in the UK. I actually saw RepRap first in New York City in 2007. Zach Smith gave a talk about machines making machines in a little organization called Dorkbot at location one in Soho. But the most interesting part, at least to me, about RepRap was the culture that it promised. It really wanted to put the power into the hands of the individual to be able to manufacture the things that we do, we use in everyday life. The vision was a world where there would be a 3D printer in every home to decentralize manufacturing, and every individual could print, print whatever they wanted, electronics, plastic, metal, food, finished goods like cell phones and sneakers. After the sale of MakerBot, there was incredible growth in sales for cheap individual use 3D printers, which meant they went man mainstream, showing up in places like Walmart and Best Buy. 3D printers were marketed as STEAM or STEM learning tools, but just a little bit of snark here. I thought a lot of mainstream users were using CAD tools to download the latest bunny rabbit and printing pieces of plastic like mad. But nonetheless, it was a great time of growth and hope for economic validation. In 2012, MakerBot went closed source with the Replicator 2. It was, it was a pretty dark time for the open hardware community. Um, we had become a small group of people working for a cause that was formed around trust. We were making hardware and sharing it altruistically and hoping for kind of like an anti-corporate world that was rich with collaboration and sharing. And as an online collective, we all shared similar values. So when MakerBot, which was arguably one of the more high profile open hardware companies split off and went its own way, it, it really felt like a betrayal. But it, you know, the upside was that it caused the open hardware community to get clear about what we stood for. Were we actually transforming hardware development or were we just basically doing regular old business but with bigger profits on the back of free community labor? Well, no, we are creators. Open hardware is transforma transformational because it refutes intellectual property laws and promotes alternative business models. One of our highest values is trust in each other. You wanna work with people who are committed to trusting each other and not lying or withholding information. So if you can share information honestly, be vulnerable, and you know, above all, be kind to one another, this, this is the best in community. So because of, or maybe in spite of, MakerBot, being, being a maker was touted as a path to prosperity and growth. Communities were springing up everywhere, and it was a lifestyle choice to work in maker-branded companies. Tindy was pretty important. It was the first open hardware marketplace. It was founded by Emile Patron and Julia Grace in 2012. 
And I just, uh, full disclosure, Supply Frame, the company I work for, purchased Tindy in 2015. The maker community was even endorsed by Obama's White House in 2014 with the Maker Fair in Washington, DC. Tech shops became a franchise and it seemed like anyone with a 3D printer, a shop bot, and the ability to pay rent on a large space was trying to make a business out of maker spaces by collecting rent and selling knowledge. But because people were still trying to understand the business model behind the words open source hardware, unfortunately, out in the commercial world, it meant free design work to some companies. At, at one point in the early, uh, around 2011, 2012, I was working at a place in Wappingers Falls, New York, which is a little bit north of New York City, where we made thermal control devices. I have a friend who designed open source hardware for refrigeration. And the team at, the leadership team at the company I worked at and my, comp and my friend embarked on a product design together. Unfortunately, my work saw his product as free engineering. They thought that because my friend put everything out online, they were entitled to use the designs in, his, in, in their product for free. They tried essentially to steal the work. And I wish I could say that this is an isolated story, but, but it's not. And I just, I bring it up because it's one of the arguments that people have against open source hardware. Won't people steal your work, they say. So fast forwarding to 2017, Naomi Wu created the Sino or the Sino bit, the first Chinese open source hardware product to be certified by the Open Source Hardware Association. And I think one of the really cool things about this product is that it has support of Chinese, Japanese, Hindi, Arabic, and other non-Latin uh, character-based languages. Also in 2017, Tech Shop closed their doors. Big corporations like Intel and General Electric pulled back from some of their initiatives. Maker Fair quit their flagship shows last year, although there are still a ton of community maker fairs. But you know, so, some things stayed the same. Hackerspaces continue to exist as community meeting places and some open hardware businesses have grown. And, and some open hardware businesses have ended as, as companies do. It's completely normal for companies to fold. It doesn't necessarily mean the end of everything. So, that's uh, an abridged version of our history for the past, whatever, 15 or so years. And though, though a bunch of years ago, hardware stood on its own, we've started a couple of trends in the last few years, which depend highly on a mix of software and hardware. FPGA and IoT. I don't even know what to call FPGA. Is it hardware? Is it software? Is it a mix? IoT is, is very dependent on software. It needs, it needs software to work. Hardware has grown into something that integrates nicely with so many other things, instruction sets, policy, healthcare, machine learning, software, DIY, bio, IoT, FPGA. I mean, the list is endless. We are everywhere. And at this point, there are a lot of people who know a lot of ways to do stuff with hardware. Some of us know how to design hardware from scratch. Other people know how to plug existing hardware into other existing hardware to create new designs. Others know how to buy hardware and add software and use it to make creative projects. We have, we have everything that we need. All of the hardware building blocks are available to us, including all of the expansion boards and shields and hats and components that we could ever want. We have access to incredible education and documentation thanks to everybody posting tutorials for the last 10 years. And we're in a great place to continue doing meaningful work. The open hardware community has a long history of solving world problems, and we definitely have been directing our energies to create positive change. As open, independent open hardware developers, we're faster to bring products up than corporations. Anytime you have a small group of people developing some, something, it's going, to be, it's going to be moving much faster than a large group of people. Pictured here is the original Arduino founding team. And so, of course, being that we're in the middle of a world crisis right now, it would be remiss of me to not mention all of this. Uh, one area in which the open hardware can be effective is community science. Right now, both scientific experimentation and medical treatment is performed with expensive and hard to access equipment. Patents, I just pulled this off of LinkedIn. 
Uh, they allow companies to own access to testing for really important things, which make them completely inaccessible to most people outside of a research facility or a hospital. That, that sucks. Routine experimental techniques are held back worldwide by lack of access to hardware. This limits the ability for citizen scientists to engage in the scientific process. And so, you know, clearly this, this approach to science holds us back from quickly creating cures to diseases and understanding how the world works. So I'm gonna take a quick look at the fight against the coronavirus. Picture is so pretty, but it's so awful. The information is changing day to day, but we've all heard by now that disease, uh, the virus started showing up nearly three months ago. It's been traveling from country to country. And here in the United States, we are experiencing a very slow ability to test for the virus. Without testing, we have no idea how many people are infected, how it's spreading, if the virus is mutating. All we know right now, today, is that it's spreading and more people are getting sick every day. As of last week, or as of this week, tests, tests for, for the virus were still not widely available. But already, people in this community, the open hardware community part that leaks into the DIY bio part, are mobilizing to figure this out. Anyone? Uh, remember OpenPCR? OpenPCR was founded in 2011 with the idea of democratizing DNA tests. The founders, Tito Jankowski and Josh Perfetto, said that they aimed to make the fundamental technologies of PCR universally accessible without intellectual property issues and to apply this fundamental technology to challenging global issues, such as point of care medical diagnostics, which is something that we need right now. They, um, they said on their website, we envision a world where molecular diagnostics are routinely used by all and do not require specialized knowledge. So what's cool about OpenPCR is that it ships with directions on not only how to put it together, but on how to use it. And so we don't know if the testing, the issue with testing in the US is lack of testing equipment like PCR machines, probably not, there's a lot of PCRs out there, or if it's something else. The test itself requires a sample of the disease and a machine like the PCR to analyze it. And we just don't know if the delay is because our government was trying to keep the numbers down or if we didn't have a good sample, but community scientists are in a position to help. And if you don't have the skills right now and you wanna help in the future, this may give you some direction of something to learn. And I just wanna quickly highlight a project. I swear this is the last slide on COVID-19 because of the type of work the open hardware community is involved with. We are help, equipped to help out. This is uh, just one giant lab, JOGL. Founders Zach Muller and Thomas Landrain are working on a number of biotechnology projects and one of them is an open source test for COVID-19. And they're looking for people with access to biolabs to do testing for this project among other things. So you can just Google that, JOGL and if you are in a position to help. Still, as a community, we need better ways to design together. And we've come up with a lot of collaboration platforms. They're still not perfect yet, and we need practical ways to work on stuff we're not in the same geographical areas. I imagine that over the next few weeks, this might actually get figured out pretty well. Certainly for me and some of the people I'm working with, it's it, we are gonna figure this out. The issue, though, lies with the cost of the hardware itself and the ability to manufacture it. Obviously, open source software has no problem whatsoever for distribution. People can work on computers and upload their work. For all purposes, open source software is then distributed among collaborators. Open source hardware is more difficult because of because you can, for example, you can put the wrong size battery into your files and it costs money and time to do every iteration until you figure out that you put the wrong size battery in the file. But still, the fact that one person can create something or that a few people can create something that many people can benefit from is, it's, it's powerful. So 2016, it was amazing to get a good print without the printer dying midway. Now, depending on your printer and process, a good print is something very accessible and something we take for granted. 2016, it cost a ton of money to get PCBs delivered quickly. Four years later, we expect our PCBs within a week. In the future, every step of hardware collaboration is gonna get easier and faster. So let's increase the access to experimental tools by making more experimental tools and sharing them. 
And back to the citizen science thing, it's not just having access to the theory, it's having access to research equipment and to the same research equipment that scientists use. Let's increase the diversity of people who have tools for knowledge and for discovery and applications like medicine and civic action. The problem, promise of the future is definitely not about making more stuff. It's about making research data and experimentation more accessible. And so in closing, it's important to remember that one single group or person can never have all the answers. To solve all of the problems that we face, whether they're here or globally, we have to come together. All of our training in design, in problem solving, in openness, in sharing, in documentation, and our collective experience can enact real and lasting change in the world. And so open hardware and all of the successes it has brought with it is a perfect example of a community in action. Thank you. And you can contact me through all of those links.